Matthew, Moses is mentioned first. Moses and Elijah. And then Jesus' face is shining. Okay? So the parallel between Jesus and Moses is very strong in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, he's got the Sermon on the Mount, just like uh, Moses delivers the commandments from the Mount. In Mark, it's quite different. In Mark, he mentions that Elijah was there with Moses. So, he mentions Elijah first. He does not mention Jesus' face shining. Because he wants the parallel between Jesus and Elijah as a prophetic figure. And Elijah is parallel all over the place. We, we kind of talked about that a week ago. Now in Luke, you have it more like Matthew with the face. But what's important in Luke is he's got a detail nobody else has. Which Pastor Monkey talked about today, which was they were discussing the Exodus or the great saving work that Jesus was going to do. Now, in all three of the versions, they all have one thing in common that's really important. That is that the voice says, Hear him. And the other figures disappear. So now you can see the transfer of allegiance, which is the way I like to put it, from the Old Testament authoritative figures of the Law and the Prophets to Jesus. And you see that in all of, of, of the accounts. But each account has its kind of own you might say, spin on it that fits into what the particular gospel writer is trying to do. And this is, see, this is why you can't really do a gospel harmony. In fact, this is, I never really thought of it until I'm telling you this right now, but this is a really good example of why a gospel harmony sort of doesn't work is that Matthew is going to emphasize the parallel between Jesus and Moses, Mark between Jesus and Elijah. So Mark mentions Elijah first, Matthew mentions Moses first. Well, if you're doing a gospel harmony, which one are you going to mention first? See, you've got to make a choice, and whichever one you do is going to determine your focus here. So thanks for bringing that up in it, but, uh, uh, but the pastor did just a fabulous job in the sermon today of relating that to the, the vision that there is before, uh, well, you know, the voice says, hear him. And as I said, the other figures disappear. But also, right before, Jesus had given passion for Jesus. And to hear him is also related to that. Listen to what he was talking about. See, listen to what he was talking about. So, to me, the transfiguration is the best, I, I mean, it's kind of steam heat. It's the best pericope in all the Gospels for preaching. Because you can do all kinds of stuff, move to the Old Testament, move to Jesus' words, the disappearance of the figures, and so on like this. And you get to distinguish each gospel each year. And go to the focus just like the uh, pastor did. You, you were here when I said that's one of the absolute finest transfiguration sermons I've ever heard. He totally was in on the text. And he wasn't preaching the event in general or something like that. I mean, that was really good. As a matter of fact, I had a class in January with uh, uh, kind of a continuing ed class. And one of the things that the students were supposed to do in the continuing ed class is prepare a sermon study at the end. And 
we could do anything we wanted. So I picked the transfiguration in Mark. And I said, you know, there's just tons of stuff. Here's a little guidance. Take a look at what's the order of the guys, you know, stuff like that. And uh, it, it's, if you can't preach this text, quit and go fix cars or something. Because, I mean, this is, this is really, this is really a, really a great one. Okay, Jim. Yeah. <coughs> Then Jesus speaks. Jesus said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. Is he referring then to himself? Holy cow, Grim, how insightful is that? There is, there is nobody else who has ever seen that except me. <laughs> this is one of my <laughs> this is one of my best pericopes for volume two because that's precisely what I argue. See, and nobody else does because they argue that Elijah is John the Baptist coming earlier. But when you see how Jesus sets it up, you start thinking stuff like this. Yes, exactly. Now we'll talk about that in 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 you know real depth when we get there in 2022. But, uh, uh, but, but this is, no, but this, this is really very, very good. If you're kind of paying attention to the flow of the text, you got to come to some conclusion like that. I mean, look how Jesus says this in this extremely cryptic way. Now, uh, folks, he is in Mark 9, starting with 9 and follow, when they're coming down <clears throat> and speaking of the resurrection. And then in 11, <clears throat> why do the scribes say that it is necessary that Elijah come first? And he declared to them, Elijah indeed upon coming is restoring or possibly is going to restore all things. <clears throat> and how is it written with respect to the Son of Man that he suffers many things and is rejected? <clears throat> now see, if you take those two halves of the sentence together, the Son of Man is the Elijah figure. Yeah, but then he goes on to say, but I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did to him as many things as they were uh, wishing. <clears throat> now, watch this last part. Just as it stands written with respect to him. Now, who is him? Everybody takes that as meaning Elijah. I think it means the Son of Man. See, that Elijah has come and they did to him as many things as they were re re uh, desiring, just as it is written with respect to the Son of Man, upon whom they did all kinds of stuff that they wanted to do. See, this is a very complex pericope. I'm going to deliver a paper either this year or next year at the National Society of Biblical Literature on this, because I think everybody else except you and me has this wrong. <laughs> yes. Now, this is in my case. You know, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> Let's keep a, get a big hand here. This was a nice piece of energy. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> oh, there's anybody who thinks Mark is simple doesn't know what it's doing. It's just and it's just such an unbelievable. <coughs> okay, well listen, let's let's get to our topic because we are moving now to the issue of here it is characteris characteristics of let me put it up here characteristics of the plot of Mark. Okay, and. We're going to spend some time on this because, uh, Ed, this sort of relates to what you're talking about here in that the way, the way Mark sets up the story is different than everybody else does. So let's take a look. 
Number one, here's the first characteristic. There is no chronology early. So you'll often find uh, just things sort of strung together. Now, Jim, let me have you open uh, your New Testament there. And I just want you to read, I'm going to give you some verses here. And I just want you to read the beginning of the verse, okay? So you can see the transition. All right, verse 21 of chapter 1. Well, yeah, we'll be in 21. 121. You want the ESV? Right? So, yeah, the ESV, yeah. And they went into the Capernaum. And okay, he... now, when is that? See, they, they, there's just this kind of vague thing. All right, back up a little bit to 116. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, we saw Simon. Right, no time in came. See? Okay, 139. And he went throughout all Galilee. Mm hmm. 218. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Mm hmm. So, okay, and then 3 1. Again, he entered the synagogue. Yeah, see? So you, you have no time frame here. And this is related to what we heard from the church father, Papias, who said that Mark wrote not, however, in order. See? This actually corresponds to this. Uh, the stories are just it, kind of like saying one time Jesus went here, another time he went there. So you don't really have a good handle on what the sequencing of stuff is. All right, number two, there is a strong sense of urgency especially in the early part of the story. And this is because of the adverb oifus, I'll transliterate, which means immediately. And so, uh, now, this would be very interesting. Uh, uh, Jim, you should have this. Do you have this in 112? The Spirit immediately broke the Okay, see, immediately. All right, how about 121? And they went into Burnham and immediately on the Okay, 23. And immediately there was in their strength. All right, 42. And immediately the leprosy left. Yeah, so this, this keeps going through the story. Now, by the way, what's really interesting, this is actually this form with thieves in Mark is actually an adjective form, which would be improper as an adverb, kind of like you don't say, I hit it real good, as, a, as opposed to well. However, just as a footnote here, Richard, uh, Plato does use the adjectival form adverb. It's kind of amazing to me when you, when you see that. So it's certainly not uh, out of the bounds of Greek literature or something like that. Now, here's what's interesting. In the middle of the gospel, when Jesus is talking to his disciples and talking about riches or talking about them accepting little children, there are no oifuses there. It kind of disappears in the middle when Jesus is instructing his disciples. 
Then, when it starts getting to Holy Week, the Euphemus reappears to kind of drive the story forward. So, uh, th this is, uh, everybody recognizes this. This is a very interesting feature of the Gospel. And now, Jim, would you just take a look at the Berkeley edition there? Uh, in those verses, let's just pick up 1, 12, 21, and 23. Did they eliminate the immediately? Well, it says in the boundary letter. All right. All right. All right. Well, the next one uh, 21. They entered the Pernam, and as soon as it was set, he went to the Oh, as house. soon as. Okay, how about 23? There was in their synagogue just then a man. All right. And 42. Yeah. Now, see, what, what's interesting about this is they try to switch vocables or descriptions as soon as, you know, something like that. But it's really good not to because you get to see Mark's actual, you get to see the underwear show here, you know. You get to see Mark's actual verbiage when you use immediately, if you don't want to use immediately, use something else. But keep using the same form because he's using the same form all the time. By the way, this is one of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because then it gets your attention. <clears throat> now, this is one of the main objections that I have to the NIV is they try to, you know, sort of massage the English so that maybe it's not repetitive or something. But you want it to be repetitive because he's being repetitive, see? So it's not right to take this out just to make the English sound better. Okay, so, uh, uh, by the way, I had a guy do a PhD for me at St. Louis on the use of immediately in the Gospel of Mark. It was very interesting because he found that it occurs only eight times in five chapters in the middle of the book. And it's missing completely from 11 verse 4 to 14 to 42. But then in the trial of Jesus, it starts revving up again. See, so what happens is that at the beginning of 11, with the entry of Jerusalem, it reappears. But then Jesus is going around and he's ruling in the temple and they talk about prayer and stuff like this, tell some parables, and all that's okay. But all of a sudden, when Jesus is captured and he is taken now to his death, immediately comes back and you know that the story is going to really drive on. Okay, number three. Conflict is tremendously high in this story. We talked about it last week. It's a major theme in Mark, and hence Jack Kingsbury entitled his book, Not Matthew S. Well, he's got Matthew S. Story. Then, he didn't do Mark S. Story. He did Conflict in Mark. Because this is such a huge factor. Conflict is constant, intense, and early, and it's all around Jewish leaders, his family, all uh, demons, and so forth. Uh, as I said last time, I'll repeat this. You get a different impression in the Gospel of Mark than you do in the Gospel of Matthew. So, in chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees and Herodians seek to destroy Jesus. This is in 3, verse 6. That same incident, and it's in the same kind of order, is in the Gospel of Matthew, but not till chapter 4. Because earlier you have the Sermon on the Mount, you have the birth stories, you've got all kinds of stuff. But my point is this. When the plot to kill Jesus doesn't occur till chapter 12, you're not getting the impression like you do in the Gospel of 
remark that this conflict is early, intense, and basically characterizes the entire story. So there's, and this would be another example here. <clears throat> what do you do if you're doing a gospel harmony? See, if you're doing Mark, the conflict starts at the beginning of chapter 3. But if you put in, if you're shoehorning in all the stuff from the Sermon on the Mount and everything, well, it's got to come later, and you don't get that impression. That's why Mark has his own way of doing it. So the conflict is early. It is intense. And it is constant. All right, number four, concealment is a big theme in the gospel of concealment. Jesus works to conceal his identity. In 124 and 25, in which there's an unclean spirit who knows who Jesus is, he commands the spirit to be silent. So, he commands silence to those who know him, especially in connection with miracles. 134, 3, 12, 543, 736. I mean, it's just all over the place. But he also works to conceal his identity, either by withdrawing from people in 145, or by trying to go around what you might call incognito. It says in 724 and 25, before the Syrophoenician woman with her daughter with the demon, it says that he was up in the area of Tyre and Sidon, and he didn't want anybody to know he was up there. And perhaps the most surprising thing, in this gospel, he actually works to hide the truth. Thus, in the parable of the sower, in verses chapter 4, 11 to 12, he says, To you is given the mystery of the kingdom, but to those outside all things are in parables, in order that seeing they may see and not see, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they turn and it be all right? Now, he says that he is, uh, he is telling me parables in, a, in order that hearing they may hear, seeing they may see and not see, and hearing they may hear and not hear. May pote, lest they turn. So this is a hard saying in 4, 11, and 12. And Hina means in order that, and Mekwate means less, in order that not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I was a PhD student at Cambridge in the early 70s, that was shortly after the introduction of the automobile. Well, um, we actually spent an entire year in the PhD seminar run by CFD Mole, the great New Testament, greatest British New Testament scholar of the mid 20th century. Uh, we spent an entire year on this parallel mark. And you know what? For probably three quarters of that time, we spent dealing with those two words because the Brits couldn't stand the idea that Jesus worked to conceal the truth. They tried every possible way to find different ways to translate. 
But this is part of the Gospel of Mark, and it is the hardening of God against people who will not accept the truth. <clears throat> so, remember, I'm going to talk about this further, but in, probably in about two weeks. This occurs, I'll give you a little hint here, this occurs after they try to kill Jesus, they accuse him of being in league with Satan, and they think he's crazy. Jesus will have none of it. And the fact of the matter is, you're going to do this to the spirit-infused Son of God, guess what? You're going to be hard. <clears throat> and we'll talk about this. This is just like, you know, we can say this, this is just like with uh, the Exodus, where at the beginning it says, Moses says, let my people go, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he wouldn't let him go. After this happens a couple of times, now the story changes. Now it says, Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, you're going to resist the grace of God. Finally, you get punished by getting what you want. This is a genuine, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So, some of you may know of the concept. Let me put this here. This has been around for about a hundred years, a little more than a hundred years. The so-called messianic secret. Now, this idea of the messianic secret came up by scholars. I mean, you'll actually hear this even in CPH material. And I, I never know why anybody gives this any credence. This is the theory that goes like this. Early Orthodox Christians believed after Jesus' resurrection that he was divine. But not before that. But if he was divine before that, how come nobody saw it? Well, according to this theory, it's because Jesus worked to conceal his identity. Well, first of all, nobody paid any attention to Jesus telling people to conceal it. You know, he would tell people to conceal it, they go out and tell. So, I mean, it, it sort of didn't work, actually. But this is all under the theory that Jesus was kind of not really divine until after he was raised, and somehow we got to think about this. But I just want you to know that phrase, messianic secret. Because sometimes when you read things about Mark, you will hear that. And, and essentially, I would say, ignore it. Because it's not actually giving credit to the Gospel of Mark, which openly shows Jesus as divine. This is all people kind of trying to figure out what really happened behind us, the scene or something like that. Okay, number five. Number five. I, I bet I'll have to erase the board here. So we get to five. Okay, number five is... Jesus interacts with demons personally. You don't get this in John. And you don't get this in Luke. But this is a big deal in the Gospel of Mark. He has verbal interaction. Now, all these spirits are called unclean. We'll talk about that. You see it. Now, Jim, I'll tell you what. Read this. 
Uh, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. This is a really good example of what I'm talking about. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Yeah, so you can see a couple of themes coming together there. He's interacting with them personally, and you see the attempt at concealment. Right. So this uh, what was that was three eleven and twelve, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now go ahead to three twenty two. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by the Elzebul, and by the prince of demons. See, now probably that accusation stems from his interpersonal reaction to the demons, with the demons. So he has some sort of relationship like this that he can interact with them personally. And I think people drew the wrong conclusion here that he's part of sort of the demonic empire. So, you know, especially, especially when he tells them not to say who he is. See? So you can see how people could, uh, could reach that. But, but here's the interesting thing. This interaction with the demonic only lasts essentially up until the first passion prediction and the transfiguration. After that, there is only one interaction, and that's in chapter 9, after the transfiguration, with the demon man with the demonized boy. That's the only time. So all of that demonic interaction takes place before the first passion. Alright, now we're coming to the most important part of what we're going to be doing this morning. I mean, I've got more points. I've got 11 points, but this is one of the real key things. And this is the notion, this has been recognized for quite a while, of intercalations, which is A, B, a prime ordering of stories. This is key. Mark, unlike the other Gospels, fairly consistently has these incidents ordered in this manner, where you have a story start, another thing intervene, and then the first one comes back. Okay? Now, the most obvious one that you all know, and it does actually occur in the other two synoptic gospels, is the healing of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. It starts out that Jairus comes to Jesus and he says, my little girl is saved. On the way, the woman confronts him. Then he goes to the house and deals with the girl. Okay, that's an intercalation. All right, so there are one or two in the other Gospels. But this is a salient feature of this Gospel. There are so many of these, and it is striking. And I'm going to list these for you now, because these are important. <clears throat> Chapter 3. His relatives come to seize him in 3 verse 20. Well, Jim, I better have you read that. Read 3 verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even meet. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Okay. Now, this is followed, Jim, 
by 21 and following, where he gets accused of being in league with Baal's woman. That's the scribes come down from Jerusalem and say he is casting out demons in league with the prince of demons. But then, what happens after this? Go to 31, Jim. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Aha! So, when that family comes, and they want to see him, this ain't a good thing. This is the back end of an intercalation where it's just like the family thinking he's crazy. Come home and be a good boy. And Jesus will have none of that. And so he says, these are my family around here. I mean, I want you people, we, we can talk about this uh, later on, but I want you people to really understand what an astonishing pericope that is. That he would actually disown his blood family for other people. This is, I mean, people don't do that here. This is the Middle East where this is everything's about blood family. So, so this one, this is three, let me put this up here, three, twenty, three, twenty-one to thirty, and then, three, I better go along here, three, twenty, three, twenty-one to thirty, and then three, was that thirty-one to thirty-four, Jim? Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay. But that the second part starts at twenty-two. Twenty twenty-one will be your first. Oh, twenty twenty-one is the first book? Right. Okay. So twenty twenty-one, twenty-two to thirty, and then this goes to thirty-five. Alright? Now, next one. This is a really interesting one. Chapter six. Everybody take a look at chapter six. Verses seven to thirteen. Here, Jesus sends his disciples out to carry out his ministry. Then, in 6, 14 to 29, you have the death of John the Baptist. And this is the longest pericope in the Gospel of Mark in which Jesus is not in character. Not, not a participant. Okay, now Jim, I want you to read uh, 6, 30 to 31. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and thought. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to leave. Okay, so, see, he sends the people out here death of John the Baptist, back they come. And we're going to talk about this here after I finish all these. Now, chapter 14. Well, uh, yeah, let's do chapter 14. Jim, uh, 14, 1 to 2. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar for our people. Okay, now, what's the next pericope in 14, 3 to 9? It's the woman who anoints Jesus before his burial. 14, 3 to 9. All right, then Jim, read 14, 10 to 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad that the promise to 
give them money. Okay, so see, that relates to the plot that was hatched in 14, 1 to 2. Now, let's go on in 14. Would you just move on in chapter 14, please? To 14, 53 to 54. Jim, go ahead on that. 53 to 54. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself with the fire. Okay, now, starting with 55, Jesus is in a hearing before the Sanhedrin. So you got Peter by the fire here. 14, 55 to uh, 65. All right? And then, what do you have in 66, Jim? And as Peter was below the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. Okay. So here we got Peter in the courtyard, Jesus having to give testimony, Peter in the courtyard. Now it's very interesting when you look at the other gospels on this one. They have this, they have these two incidents. But they just have them in blocks next to each other. You got Peter in the courtyard, you got the whole thing, and then you got Jesus there before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, you got the whole thing. Mark is doing something with these stories that nobody else does. And then, and I've saved this as kind of last, even though it's out of order. There are others of these, but I'm giving you the main ones. Chapter 11. I want you all to go to chapter 11. All right, now we'll start out. Jim, I'm going to have to read here. I want you to back up till 10 and then do 11. No, no, but, but verse 10. Verse all. No. Verse 10 of chapter 11. Yeah, and, but then chapter 11 was what I want. Okay. 11 11. But go to 11 10. Verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of God. All right, that's what the crowd said. Now, what does it say about it? And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. All right, no other gospel has it. That he enters Jerusalem, goes into the temple, looks around, and goes out again. Okay, this sets up a key intercalation. All right, so 11, 11. Now, Jim, read 12 to 14. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaf, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Okay? Now, what happens next? 11, 15 to 18. Go ahead. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold. Oh, okay. That'll be enough. Okay. Good here. Temple. Fig tree. Curse, temple, with Jesus casting stuff out. <clears throat> now, when you look at these intercalations, what you start to see is that the middle point
The B element is the key and has hermeneutical significance over against the outer envelope. So in other words, it's the inside factor that is the significant factor and illuminates what's outside. <clears throat> Example, this is why I ended here. <clears throat> Jesus curses the fig tree. How does the future of the temple look? Okay. Jesus is bearing witness before hostile people. On the outside, here is Peter. This is not, this is not some random event of Peter in the courtyard. He's being forced to bear witness. He fails. Jesus succeeds. How about this? The woman anoints Jesus before his burial. Why does Jesus praise him, her so much, and say, what she has done will be spoken of everywhere in memory of her? Why does he say that? Because she anointed him for his burial because she believed the passion prediction and the resurrection prediction. That he would in fact die. The rest of the people weren't believing that. Okay? What's on the outside? Plotting against Jesus. We know from the intercalation the plot will succeed. She is anointing him for his so they're, they're plotting to kill him and they will. However, however, she anoints him for his burial because she knows he won't be there on Easter. Remember how the women come on Easter morning to anoint it? She knew that. She knew that he had given the passion prediction and the resurrection prediction. So since he wasn't going to be there to anoint the body, she did it ahead of time. And that's why what she has done will be said throughout the world in memory of her. It is the greatest single expression of faith in the whole gospel. It, it is unbelievable. And of her insight, this is the thing, and of her insight, see? So, I've got stuff to talk about when we get there in 2027. Uh, but there, and this, is, this is probably the greatest pericope in the Gospel of Mark. Inside the intercalation with the things on the outside, so that while the plot will succeed, it will not ultimately succeed. What about here? the death of John the Baptist. The death of John the Baptist as one who is faithful to the message of God. What's on the outside? You're sending people out to do the work of the kingdom and they're coming back. This is dangerous work that can well end in death just the way John the Baptist wound up with his confession for the Lord that <clears throat> interprets the outer envelope. And here, Beelzebub, that's inside his family thinking he's crazy and wants to take him into custody. That's satanic temptation. That's satanic action. That is not just 
some kind of a mutual thing going on. Jesus' entire ministry is being threatened by this kind of satanic activity. Folks, this is brilliant. This is unbelievable. Anybody who thinks this is this simple, crude gospel is not paying attention. No other gospel writer does interpolations like that. Now, we have to let the other ship drop. <laughs> because in the course of doing volume two, I discovered that Mark's even better than this. He has, everybody recognized the intercalation. But I am going to contend that he has a further thing that I have come to call stepping stones. And that is A, B, A prime, B prime. And when you get a B prime, that becomes a super important pericope. And it emphasizes that point there. <clears throat> now, Jim, I want you to go to 11. This is why I took this last. <clears throat> so after the cleansing of the temple in 11, 18, I want you to read on from 19. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Ha ha! The fig tree comes back. I wonder what you're going to do with that. Yes. So this was the fig tree, and now all of a sudden you get eleven, nineteen, and how long does that discussion go? To about twenty-five. Well, he starts speaking in 22. He talks about faith and yeah, yeah, right. prayer. Yeah, through 26. Through 26, right. Through 26. So all of a sudden, the fig tree comes back. And I discovered this simply by wrestling with the text. Because I had seen this. You have fig tree, you have temple, you have fig tree. Except you got temple in the first part. And you got temple, fig tree, temple, fig tree. So, folks, there is no way that Jerusalem temple is ever going to be rebuilt. It is finished. It is absolutely finished. And I'll tell you what, all of these people, like uh, uh, Mike Huckabee and so on, who are real big on uh, evangelicals for Israel and all that kind of stuff, they got to get a grip on the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark will disabuse you of any notion that there is a rebuilding of a Jerusalem temple or that the place where the presence of God is is in the Jerusalem temple. It isn't. It isn't. Why? Because, as Jesus says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. That's Him. He is the temple of God and the place where God is. And it ain't that building. And you know that thing is absolutely so, there are others of these stepping stones here, but this, I have discovered, is about two or three of these that are very interesting and are just with key, key peripheries like this. All right? Uh, I'll tell you what, we're after 22. I have a couple of more things I want to say about this because Mark uses these intercalations 
also from uh, for other stuff in the construction of the gospel, and I'll pick it up there the next time. Jim, we have a question. A textual question. Yeah. In the ESV, we don't actually have verse 26, and there's no note saying why we go from 25 to 27. In for toil, we have a 26 in parentheses. And this is in chapter uh, 11. Yeah. <clears throat> right. For toil has in parentheses, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Yeah. And well, he has no note either as to what is that. Right, right. Exactly. Well, right. Verse 26 appears in the King James because it's by the majority of manuscripts, which were the, the ones that they used for the King James. And, uh, yeah, but if you do not forgive as your Father in heaven uh, will forgive you, right? So, uh, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Uh, so, that's a verse that's missing because of manuscript evidence. Yeah, so the preferred manuscript, which I've talked about, uh, like B, R, B, L, Delta, and so on, all omit. That, that's why. I don't know if they. Have. Yeah, I, Okay, intercalation. That is obviously a literary trick. Right. I mean, is Plato using stuff like this? I mean, there are other contemporaries. I mean, I realize Plato predates Mark. But there are other yeah, yeah. contemporaries who, who do that. Because, I mean, I. I not, I have not found that in Plato uh, because I think Plato's got the closest linguistically to, to Mark. Uh, what I should, I'm glad you raised that because I actually haven't checked it from that point of view. I like to see if Homer does it because Homer has all kinds of linguistic background to what Mark is doing and story-wise as well. But whether he does intercalations is, uh, I was just wondering if there's somebody I can ask about that. Oh, but, uh, he, he might, he might know, yeah. he might know. Um, I'd like to have somebody who's a little bit more invested in the Gospel of Mark. Um, but uh, thanks, I'm going to pursue that. I'm just curious because if yeah. so that's a literary trip. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, it appears to be rather a uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, we, you know, having come back from you know, the general area, we, we, we tend to sort of just throw them all an unsophisticated bunch of people, which they're not. Mm -hmm. You know, and which they're not. Right. And so, I mean, to see that, I'm, try, I'm trying to run rummaging through my head, trying to see if there's any. Um, you know, English authors who are playing and stuff like that. I, and I'm trying to think, and I can't think of anyone. I mean, I can certainly see that construction in musical context. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it has to come from the Greeks. In the sense that the musicians right. are, are thinking in terms of Greek writer. Yeah. See, I think that Mark has a lot of parallels more to music almost than he does to literature. Well, he seems to be a lot, he seems to actually to be a scholar. Mm -hmm. Something's going on here. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, he's thinking at a completely different level. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, so he's thinking this way. That means other people have to be thinking this way or other people have to be able at that time to pick up on that way of emphasizing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's exactly right. <clears throat> See, this is one of the reasons why I don't think Mark can be the first gospel and early gospel. Because I have no idea why anybody, if Mark is first, <coughs> it means that Matthew and Luke came and they undid the intercalations. Why would you do that? You know, it, it's it's a beautiful construction here. Why would you do that and just put the stories next to each other? Th that's why this is actually a literary presentation of the story of Jesus. If you want kind of more, here's the facts, ma'am, to go read Luke. But if you you know if you want something that's gonna grab you, this is this is the kind of gospel that you want to have. Yeah, that's well Mike that's great if question. you Google anybody uses intercalations, 
Mark comes up, and then they're all mathematical. Good. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, that's you know, just a quick search. Intercalations. Yeah, I just said, you know, authors who use intercalations, and Mark comes up, and then the rest of the things are all mathematical oh. things. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't seen, in, in dealing with this, I haven't seen somebody say something like, Dionysius of Halicarnassus uses these or something. I haven't really seen anybody talk about it that way. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, this is why Mike's question is so good. People, I, I'm always amazed how what I would call incurious people are. You know, for example, I found just by rummaging around that the Greek of the of the Gospel of Mark in the Passion narrative parallels virtually exactly the death of Socrates in Phaedo, Plato's Phaedo. <clears throat> by its tense usages, by its usages of uh, uh, conjunctions and so on, so that the actual death of Socrates, the actual death of Jesus is described with the same linguistic profile. The previous stuff has a linguistic profile. Now, nobody's ever seen that. Why? I don't know. I guess they're just not curious. Just didn't take a look. I thought, oh, take a look. Let's see if it looks like that. So it could be that this simply hasn't kind of gotten on the radar in some way. Or, we've got ourselves a real genius on our hands here, that actually... Well, he, he had to know, I mean, you know, he's using that tool. Yeah, now, but here's, here's where a parallel would be linguistic Hebrew, because the Psalms do this all the time. So, you have these intercalations of meanings but not necessarily a story. So, yeah, but linguistically you have that. I don't know. You know, I think the Old Testament should be mined a little bit here. I'll talk to Andy Bartell about this. Uh, because he's, he's picked it up from somewhere. And he's decided that this is a good yeah. use for emphasis. Well, you know, if everyone else is struggling and they, they don't get see that, then they're not going to see that emphasis. Then they're not going to see the emphasis. Yeah, and so it's sort of like, you know, he, you know he's, he's, he's holding up the uh, oil painting up in front of the swine. They don't care. Yeah, you know, yeah. You've got all this, this work. Yeah. But, but I'll tell you this. It's also true, like, for example, my friend Andy Bartell, when he preaches, will use this ABA construction, and after he would preach in chapel, you know, I'd say to him, hey, I really like the way you were using that ABA construction, came back, he said, you noticed it, and I did it that way, he said, I don't know how, how many other people noticed it, but he did it to do it, yeah, you know, I mean, just for the pleasure of it or something like that, and uh, uh, so, you know, we're interpreting this. Notice how what we're doing here, what Mike's question is doing for us. It's just rubbing our nose in the text. And here's what we're not doing, and that's this is important. We're not using the text as some kind of vehicle to reconstruct a life of Jesus or something. No, we're actually reading this text. We are respecting these words, this story, this way of putting it together, and letting that instruct us. The biggest problem with this sort of critical method is it's so darn, I don't know, what would you say, self-absorbed. You know, uh, what? Well, yes, but the mind is better than God's word. But, but, I, I'm making a different point, Joe. Yeah. It, it's, you know, kind of like uh, my concerns are more important than the text concerns. So we use the text. We're not trying to use the text. We're trying to obey the text. We're not trying to listen to the text and do what it says and be 
what would you say? Inundated by the law and the gospel of the text. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. But when you do that recitation, you you and your buddies yes, yes. the mark. How do you handle the intercalation? Do you have one guy do it, do the outer parts, and then another guy do the center part? Or no, <laughs> no. The person will move on the stage. Oh. So you start out in chapter 14 with the plot. Then with the woman, you're over here. When the plot comes back, you move back over here. We do it. We do it. Subliminally. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, the, question, the questions that keep popping into my mind are, do, if, if I were listening to it, what I get? Mm -hmm. In other words, I mean, you know, I can see where the motion is oh, you know, getting me back. Yeah. If I can start tying this stuff in there, I mean, until you point this out, you know, I've not put two and two together yeah. before. Yeah. This guy. I mean, yeah. Right. Well, let, let me just say here, and I'll, I'm going to start with this the next time. But I discovered then that there are ways in which Mark does this just literarily at the beginning. Would you all please turn to chapter 1, verses 1 and 5? Just turn. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 5. Now it goes like this. The beginning of the preaching of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger before your face who will prepare your ways. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John came on the scene, the one baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is one of my parts. Okay, now I'm going to show you how I actually do it, really. <clears throat> The beginning of the preaching of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger before your face who will prepare your ways. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came on the scene the one baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let me show you what I am doing. <clears throat> Visually, compared to trying to convey what Mark is doing in his brilliant construction to begin the gospel. <clears throat> one verse one. Not the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the beginning of the preaching of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This has its parallel with John came on the scene. That's why I started there, moved there, and came back here. Now in 1b, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Now the next line is not in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your ways. That's from Malachi 3 and Exodus 23.20. Sending messenger. Now comes verse 3. Voice of one crying in wilderness. That's from Isaiah 40. Look at this. It's incredible. And that construction right there, by the way, it took me six months to figure this out. I could not understand what Mark was doing at the beginning of his gospel. <clears throat> but the key is seeing that the first part is the beginning of the preaching of the good news. John came on the scene, 
proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming. So, <clears throat> let me do it again. Watch my motions. Beginning of the preaching of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your ways. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came on the scene. He went baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is stunning. So this, is yeah. this is stunning stuff. So he nests stuff. Exactly. Nests stuff. Yeah. And, and then this is, and see, an intercalation is a simple nesting. It's a simple nesting of uh, ABA of, of a, two stories. And this is a more complex nesting. This is more complex nesting. See, this has bothered everybody for centuries. Why does it talk about being written in Isaiah the prophet and then instead of Isaiah the prophet, what you get is you get quotations from either Malachi 3 or Exodus 23, 20. And now you get here. Well, it finally hit me. He's doing an intercalation of these. And he's got that, I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your ways. Well, I mean, the profundity of this, we'll talk about this, but let me just say it now. I'm sending a messenger who will prepare your ways, but whose way is being prepared? The way of Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. That's Jesus. I mean, this is high theology. I mean, isn't this incredible? It took me six months to figure this out. And uh, I wasn't getting this. Once I got this, once I got this, then, then I, could, I could get this. Man, I mean, we are dealing with one first-rate mind here. So I'm glad you explained that, because you're moving around, to me, is that you're just including different sides of the, yeah. the audience <clears throat> yeah. for listening. Right. You know? No, no. But the second time, it was, it was different now than we have yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right. But this is what this is what the guys do as they're doing these things. Uh, later in the gospel, is they move around. So if you've got the plot in fourteen, and they were seeking to kill him, then they'll move to a different spot on the stage and talk about the woman anointing and all that. Now Judas is going to come back and agree. So then you move back to this side of the stage when you're when you're doing that. To, <clears throat> Kind of well, listen, guys. Man, life is new. <laughs> this is uh, uh, I'm just so happy people like this. I, 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 this is such a geeking thing for me. <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, so let's, let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have given us your word, and you have given us your inspiring word, and inspired word in the Gospel of Saint Mark. Open our hearts always to hear, to hear all of your evangelists, so that we may embrace the word of life. Amen. Thanks a lot, folks. We'll pick it up here.